This week, the Union moves to decapitate the Confederacy from all angles. The first thing this week is an order. General Order number 143. General Orders number 143, War Department, Adjutant General's Office. Washington, May 22nd, 1863. First, a bureau is established in the Adjutant General's Office for the record of all matters relating to the organization of colored troops. An officer will be assigned to the charge of the Bureau, with such number of clerks as may be designated by the Adjutant General. Second, three or more field officers will be detailed as inspectors to supervise the organization of colored troops at such points as may be indicated by the War Department in the northern and western states. Third, Boards will be convened at such posts as may be decided upon by the War Department to examine applicants for commissions to command colored troops, who, on application to the Adjutant General, may receive authority to present themselves to the Board for examination. Fourth, no person shall be allowed to recruit for colored troops, except specially authorized by the War Department, and no such authority will be given to persons who have not been examined and passed by a board, nor will such authority be given any one person to raise more than one regiment. Fifth, the reports of boards will specify the grade of commission for which each candidate is fit, and authority to recruit will be given in accordance. Commissions will be issued from the Adjutant General's office when the prescribed number of men is ready for muster into service. Six, color troops may be accepted by companies to be afterward consolidated in battalions and regiments by the adjutant general. The regiments will be numbered seritum in the order in which they are raised, the numbers to be determined by the adjutant general. They will be designated. Regiment of U.S. Colored Troops. Seventh, recruiting stations and depots will be established by the Adjutant General as circumstances shall require, and officers will be detailed to muster and inspect the troops. Eighth, the non-commissioned officers of color troops may be selected and appointed from the best men of their number, in the usual mode of appointing non-commissioned officers. Meritorious commissioned officers will be entitled to promotion to higher rank if they prove themselves equal to it. Ninth, all personal applications for appointments in colored regiments or for information concerning them must be made to the chief of the bureau. All written communications should be addressed to the chief of the bureau, to the care of the adjutant general, by order of the Secretary of War, E.D. Townsend, Assistant Adjutant General. This is a clear sign from the War Department towards the future of the Union's army. So far, the use of colored troops has been limited in scope and only in small numbers. The creation of the Bureau of Colored Troops says that in the future, the use of African Americans in the Army will be expanded. The Bureau is headed by Major Charles W. Foster, a prominent Ohioan. Then we move to Vicksburg, where Major General Ulysses S. Grant has planned the next assault. Last week on the 19th, Grant had sent forward his Army of the Tennessee to assault Lieutenant General John C. Pemberton's force, currently besieged in the Mississippi City. The assault, well, failed. Learning the strength of the 15th Corps under Major General William Tecumseh Sherman and the 17th Corps under Major General James B. McPherson, while leaving the 13th Corps under John A. McClarend, well, relatively unscathed. For days, there has been planning, and on the 22nd, the cannons open up on the Confederate positions. 10 a.m., the thundering of heavy guns overshadows the simultaneous assaults of the three corps. The attack was gallant, and portions of each of the three corps succeeded in getting up to the very parapets of the enemy and in planting their battle flags upon them, but at no place were we able to enter. General McPherson moves forward his Midwest brigades against enemy head-on. They stay far away, dodging grenades and volleys. Their ladders are too short to effectively scale the enemy walls. General Sherman assaults from the north with his two divisions of Major General Francis Blair and Major General James Turtle. 
Troll's division takes heavy fire and is thrown back. Ware is able to send his brigades to strike the Confederates. They are able to decimate the Confederate divisions, but are still repulsed. Jean McLaren moved in heavily, sending two of his divisions to take two major fortifications. General Eugene A. Carr moves against the Railroad Redoubt, and General Peter J. Osterhaus assaults the Star Fortification. They may move onto the line, waving their flags, and McLaren thinks he has won. He asks for reinforcements, believing the Confederates to be receiving their own. The Star and Stripes are flying over them. Grant tells McLaren to use his own reserves as reinforcements. Grant still rejects him, but he also shows it to his right-hand man, General Sherman. McLaren can't ever be trusted. He is an egotist, unreliable fool. But Sherman doesn't know this as well as Grant does, and sees victory just to charge away. Sherman charges and is repulsed at a great cost. Grant is still thinking. McLaren can't be trusted. Could you imagine if he wasn't lying? Vixer can be taken. He just needs a division. And McPherson is right there. The Order's division transferred to McLaren. And may God help their souls. <laughs> McPherson himself charges with his own forces, trying to keep the pressure up on the Confederates, but his men just can't press the fortifications. They're just too harsh. Sherman orders another assault that goes so poorly, he tells General Turtle, This is murder. Order those troops back. McLaren receives General Quinby's division from McPherson and orders an assault. General McLaren's dispatch has misled me as to the real state of the facts. It caused much of this loss. He's entirely unfit for the position of Corps Commander, both on the march and on the battlefield. Looking after his corps gives me more labor and infinitely more uneasiness than all the remainder of my department. Grant lost the day at a steep cost. 502 KIA, 2,550 wounded in service, and 147 captured or missing. The Confederates didn't even suffer combined 500 casualties. The entire assault can't be blamed on McLaren, but those later assaults are his fault. The question is, what can General Grant do about it? General Grant has full and absolute authority to enforce his own commands and to remove any person who, by ignorance, inaction, or any other cause, interferes with or delays his operations. Grant denies the request for a truce, whipping it will make him look weak. As the summer heat rots the corpses and the screams of the wounded grow, he relents on the 25th. The two sides talk to each other and trade food. If Johnson tries to cut his way in, we will let him do it, and then see that he doesn't get out. You say he has 30,000 men with him? That will give us 30,000 more prisoners than we now have. Grant talks with his men as they work on a huge system of trenches. Pemberton is a northern man who has got into bad company. And on the 25th, Grant issues another order. Corps commanders will immediately commence the work of reducing the enemy by regular approaches. It is desirable that no more loss of life shall be sustained in the reduction of Vicksburg. The capture of the garrison, every advantage will be taken from the natural inequalities of the ground to gain positions from which to start mines, trenches, or advanced batteries. Let's move to another siege. This on Port Hudson. And on the 27th, there is an assault. They charge and charge and ch charge. And the sources for this are very official and hard to talk about. Assaults are made by each of General Nathaniel P. Banks' divisions, but the fortifications are too strong for them. He even uses the 1st and 3rd Native Guard regiments, all black units. The assault is repulsed with cannon musket fire killing some of their officers. None of the 19th Corps assaults even breached the parapets. Last thing this week is the movement of a unit, the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. They are a full-colored unit that moved out of Boston on the 28th of May and moves towards Beaufort, South Carolina. Then there are Sickles. He collects flowers at his camp at Stafford Heights in the area of Boscobo... Boscobo... 
Oh, he is sick, sadly, with persistent enteritis. Has requested sick leave, which makes sense. Hooker's army camp has become a cesspool of the plague, with sickness taking a high toll on each of the corps. That's where the week ends with two failed assaults. Last week, I left you off with the sieges of Port Hudson and Vicksburg. This week, they continue at the cost of more men. And who will replace these soldiers? Will the Bureau in 54th Massachusetts answer that? Will be enough, though. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Hello, it's the entire Civil War Week by Week team here. If you liked the video, please like it. If you want to see more, right now there should be a playlist and a best of video. And I do hope to see you next week. If you want to see how the Civil War continues, please subscribe. Thank you, and I'll see you next week.